Hi, everybody. Welcome along to this session. My name is Katie Martin. I'm the markets editor at the FT in London, and we're going to be discussing sustainability at the heart of discussions. And I think it's fair to say it is at the heart of discussions in financial markets generally now. It comes up in conversations I have with people all the time, and whether the issue is biodiversity or social justice or global health or whatever it is, it's become a really important part of the investment process. Um, so I'm joined by an excellent panel today to go through this issue with me. In no particular order, we have Marc-André Blanchard, who's the head of CDPQ Global. Hi, Jean- hi, hi Marc-André. Yes, good morning. Good afternoon for you, but good morning, everyone. <laughs> exactly. We have Kunal Kapoor, who's the CEO of Morningstar. And we morning. have, hi, and we have Christy Mitchum, who's the CEO of BMO Asset Management. Um, I'm excited morning. to get through this, uh, this conversation today with you all today. So, Kunal, can you set the scene for us a little? This does seem to have been a real breakthrough year for sustainable investment. How much investment has there been along these lines this year? And how robust has this investment style been in what's been a pretty hairy year for investors globally? Sure, I'm happy to kick off there, Katie, and thanks uh, everyone uh, for joining us this morning. Katie, obviously where you're sitting, uh, the adoption of ESG has been very much front and center for a few years now. And actually, if you move over to North America, the adoption has perhaps been a little bit slower than you otherwise um, you know, might see elsewhere in the world. But that's not the case uh, anymore. And I, I went and pulled some data Uh, just for the U.S. for this year to give everyone a sense of what's going on. And it's pretty remarkable. In fact, um, if you look at the data, sustainable funds in the United States attracted um, more than 30 billion in net flows in 2020 through the end of the third quarter. And, um, you know, more starkly, it took only until July of this year for sustainable funds to garner more flows than they did in the entire uh, year of 2019. And even in 2019, where we had more than 20 billion, more than 21 billion actually, uh, of flows, that was four times higher than in any previous year um, that we had experienced. So flows have been averaging about 10 billion per quarter, accelerating quarter on quarter. And you know we see this um, across the board uh, in the ESG market, uh, even our, you know, sustainalytics uh, business, if you look at um, the work we're doing on green bonds, that's a sector that, you know, has really exploded, uh, starting with Europe really driving that activity. And I, I think, um, you know, when, when, when you open the papers these, these days, if you open the FD, the um, talk about investing and what resonates with investors is very much about ESG. So um, I think as much as in Europe, we have uh, certainly... Um, you know, started to move ahead in a very meaningful way and sort of talk about the next generation of ESG and what comes next. Uh, in the U.S. and Canada, we're playing catch up, but we're starting to move pretty quickly. Um, and I think in North America, you're going to see some very, very um, meaningful jumps in the way ESG is deployed. And we'll talk about that, obviously, in this mm-hmm. conversation. But certainly in Canada, too, it's starting to move uh, to the center of the conversation. Mm. And it covers so many areas, right? Because it's come up as part of the discussion around biodiversity and, and global health, as I mentioned, and all kinds of things. So, Marc Andre, I know you've got um, you've had a very varied career to date, but as a lawyer, as a business leader, as an ambassador. How does all how do all of these pieces fit together, and how does that inform what you do now? And uh, je sais que vous allez répondre en français. Alors, bonjour tout le monde, ça me fait plaisir. Merci d'être là et, et merci à la Conférence de Montréal. Euh, je, je, ce que je vous dirais dans un premier temps, je suis, c'est en fait, les, mes trois carrières se ressemblent beaucoup parce que euh, c'est, c'est tout à propos des relations entre individus et de la confiance. Alors, c'est, ça revient à cette question primordiale-là, que vous soyez dans les services professionnels ou que vous soyez en diplomatie ou en investissement. Et, euh, et quand je suis arrivé à l'ONU, euh, les, 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 la, la question des objectifs de développement durable et de l'accord de Paris venait d'être signé. Et, et alors, les deux grands risques qui sont toujours les mêmes aujourd'hui sur la planète, ce sont les changements climatiques d'une part et les inégalités de l'autre. 
Et euh, j'ai demandé à Ben Kimon à ce moment-là, j'ai dit, écoutez, je suis, qui était le secrétaire général, d'ailleurs, j'ai dit, qu'est-ce que je peux faire, moi, un gars qui arrive du secteur privé, qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire ici? Et il m'a dit, il y a une, une, une chose que je t'en supplie, s'il te plaît, fais le focus sur comment on peut changer la discussion autour du financement. Parce que sans le financement, sans le rôle du secteur privé pour financer la lutte aux inégalités ou la lutte au changement climatique, on n'y arrivera pas. Et ça, pour moi, c'est un peu un choc que le secrétaire général parle immédiatement du rôle du secteur privé pour la lutte euh, aux inégalités. Le changement climatique, je m'y attendais. mais là. Et là, ce que j'ai fait pendant les presque cinq ans où j'étais à l'ONU, j'ai vraiment travaillé sur essayer comment on fait pour aligner un, le, un peu plus le, le capital un peu plus avec le développement durable. Comment on fait pour s'assurer qu'il y ait plus d'investissements euh, dans les énergies renouvelables, mais aussi qu'il y ait plus d'investissements dans les infrastructures. Parce que la lutte aux inégalités, la réponse, c'est des infrastructures plus bâties plus rapidement et de façon plus euh, sustainable euh, qu'elles ne l'ont été faites dans le passé. Et, euh, et, et dans les pays aussi, ce qu'on appelle les marchés frontières. Et, et là, ce qui m'est apparu, c'est que et ce qui est clair, c'est qu'on quand on connaît pas un marché, on a tendance à surévaluer les risques et sous-évaluer les opportunités. Ça, c'est une erreur que beaucoup d'investisseurs font. Et, 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 et là, l'autre aspect, c'est que au même moment où il y a toute cette question-là euh, de, de travailler avec euh, pour, pour pousser le capital un peu mieux aligné avec le, le développement durable, vous avez eu aussi les consommateurs qui sont venus. Il y a plus de 50 des consommateurs euh, qui euh, indiquent qu'ils sont prêts à changer leur habitude de consommation pour euh, réduire leur impact sur l'environnement. Il y a plus de 70 des consommateurs qui disent, euh, selon McKinsey, qu'ils sont prêts à payer 5 de plus pour un produit vert, euh, que euh, s'il était aussi performant comme des autos, des bâtiments, de l'électronique. Alors, on voit euh, que ce qu'on a, qu a dit, qu'il y a une soif des investisseurs, des, des consommateurs et aussi des investisseurs, puis ce sont les milléniaux qui euh, mènent la barque. On a vu pendant les dernières années, euh, les, 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 vous savez, un vaste mouvement euh, dans, dans les, des jeunes dans les rues. Alors, c'est ce qui entraîne cette chaîne et cette demande plus grande pour le SG. Mais pour la caisse de dépôt, quand on arrive à la caisse de dépôt, et, et c'est que quand tu as un investisseur à long terme, la question ESG devient complètement, c'est hyper important parce que on possède des actifs pendant de nombreuses années. Alors, pour nous, le développement durable est prioritaire, est, est prioritaire parce que il en tient de la valeur de nos actifs euh, pour soutenir et développer la valeur de nos actifs pour le bénéfice de nos déposants, il faut euh, que en fait qu'on qu s'assure du développement durable. Et c'est pour ça qu'il y a trois aspects pour nous. Je vais terminer là-dessus. Le premier aspect, c'est l'aspect environnemental. On a une politique depuis 2017 à la Caisse de dépôt et qui euh, on, on, et, et on a eu un gros succès à cet égard-là. On a augmenté, on a maintenant un portefeuille sobre en carbone de 34 milliards. On a réduit notre intensité carbone de 20 On était l'un des premiers investisseurs institutionnels à lier la compensation de notre leadership à la Caisse de dépôt avec notre empreinte carbone. Et ça a eu un effet très direct. Et on l'a vu en fin de semaine, la Caisse de dépôt est l'un des leaders avec l'alliance Net Zero qui vient d'annoncer des objectifs de neutralité carbone d'ici 2050. C'est là que ça veut dire quand les gens se mettent ensemble, il y, a, il y a des choses qui se passent. Il y a eu euh, 30 investisseurs institutionnels cette, cette, qui valent euh, 9 euh, 000 milliards, 9 trillions, euh, qui sous actifs en sous gestion, qui ont déclaré cette, qui se sont engagés ce week-end à euh, une, une neutralité carbone d'ici 2050. Et la Caisse de dépôt a joué un très grand rôle là-dedans. Rapidement, la diversité et l'inclusion, ça c'est le deuxième facteur de G pour nous. Et là, c'était important. On a fait il y a quelques semaines l'annonce d'un fonds de 250 millions de dollars qui démontre à quel point le rôle des institutionnels sur cette lutte aux inégalités aussi. On a dit, si les compagn la compagnie rencontre le test trip de 25 de l'actionnariat, 25 du management et 25 des administrateurs qui, sont, qui représentent de la diversité, on investira dans ces compagnies-là. Ils ont créé un fonds de 250 millions de dollars. Et pour finir, c'est la politique, la gouvernance est nécessaire dans ce cas-là. 
et on vient de, de, de produire une nouvelle politique sur les, les votes lors des assemblées annuelles des compagnies qu'on a en portefeuille. Et on dit, on a une cible de 30 de représentation féminine dans les conseils d'administration. D'ici 2022, euh, si ce niveau-là n'est pas atteint, mais là, on pourra voter, s'abstenir ou voter contre les administrateurs responsables des nominations de ces compagnies-là. Alors, ça envoie un message qui est très, très clair euh, à tout l'écosystème euh, des investisseurs. Oui, merci. So, Christy, um, Marc-André made some important points there around shifting consumer tastes. Now, how much real penetration does that have into the investment world? Do we do the same with our personal consumption as we do with our money? Is there still a large community of people who haven't got this message yet? Well, I, I, that's an, actually a, a very interesting question, and it's one that we spent some time trying to answer as part of some larger survey work uh, that we did towards the beginning of this year. And I think there really are, it's quite a nuanced answer. I think, first of all, I would say most consumers actually want to see at least some part of their values and uh, personal missions sort of embodied in their investment portfolio. But I think there is a range in terms of how well people are actually able to translate what they believe in personally to what they invest in. And what we're finding is that probably about 20 to 25 percent of the investing population today has found a way to translate their personal values into their investment portfolios. Another 30 percent would really like to do so, but they need some help. So what I would say is it's a trend and it's a continuum in terms of how well people are able to express, again, their purpose in their portfolio. I would note, however, more broadly, that I think this whole space of, of making consumer choices, making investment choices on the basis of values is really accelerating. And maybe just a couple of key statistics that would be interesting for our audience. Um, one pulled from the FT, of course, uh, from, from this summer, which actually cited that about 60% of Americans were willing to make a choice, a consumption choice, on the basis of how a company reacted to the George Floyd protests. So that's really a strikingly large number. We also find similarly large numbers and also jump shifts over the past two years when we look at data from other sources. Um, one other additional fact um, from compute cards actually showed that about 38% of consumers are boycotting at least one brand today. And that's up from about 12% in 2018. So definitely, when we think about social engagement, when we think about social media, the ability to understand issues and to collectively organize around them, it's accelerating. I think people started consumer choices, but we're going to see that bleeding over into investment choices, I think, um, with uh, increasing prevalency. I would just like to remind everybody in the audience that you're very welcome to ask questions if you have any. So use the little magic box and, and ask away. Um, we'll try and get to them at the end of the discussion. But um, Kunal, as you mentioned, this, this whole ecosystem has become more nimble, I guess, over the past 12 months. We've seen a huge rise in sustainability linked bonds, which are often slightly different from, from green bonds, for example. Um, how many different strategies do you find cropping up? Yeah, I think as uh, Christy started to, um, you know, touch on, there are more than a few, right? And, and <laughs> that's one of the challenges in navigating this market. But really, I, I think today we're talking about a world of strategies because that's how traditional asset management uh, and wealth management has um, occurred. But all of that being said, uh, Katie, I think what's important and where it's worth taking a step back is to understand that ESG actually is only accelerating the trend towards personalization in investments. Right. And so while we're sitting here and saying ESG can have many cuts and it can be very different because uh, your values could be different than Christie's values and different from mine, um, the reality is in, in the way that um, most investment strategies available today, they still don't get down to that level of detail. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're going to see is that because technology is enabling a very meaningful change in how um, wealth and asset management services are delivered, mm -hmm. uh, it's very possible that in the future there will be a personalized delivery for each of us, which will reflect the choices 
that we're making. And so when I think about um, the future and, uh, you know, whether it's a question of too much choice or, or whatnot, it could be that there is more choice, but the trade-off, and, and historically choice has not been good in asset management because it usually has meant chasing hot products and whatnot. Mm. Um, but I think uh, one, one thing we lose um, is that many people around the world are not engaged investors. And they're not engaged investors either because they don't have time or they don't have conviction or they don't have interest. And I know it may be hard uh, for people here to believe, but that's often the case. Yet you have governments around the world increasingly asking individuals to take control of their own finances and their own retirement. And in that world, if you want to get people engaged and you want to open the tent and democratize the process of investing, ESG does that. And so to, to the extent that that means more strategies and ultimately more personalization, I think that's okay because the technology around it is much better than ever before. It's only going to get better. And whether you're a passive or an active investor, um, your ability to express a view and be compelled to build a portfolio around it, mm -hmm. I think is going to change the playing field. And so, yes, you're right. There is an explosion all over the place, and I think it will continue. But I think over time, it's also going to come down to a few categories that really matter to people and allow them to express themselves in a meaningful way. You could even see sort of this intersection of proxy voting and yeah. ESG, right? Um, where today, even if you buy into an ESG fund, you might feel otherwise in terms of the way the proxy is voted. So the mm -hmm. possibilities are endless and, and, and I think very meaningful in that context. You, you raise a really interesting point around how we democratize finance because the reality is that it's still the preserve of the wealthy few effectively. How do we change that? Marc Andre, what are, what are your thoughts there? How do we make this whole this whole industry reach more people? Well, uh, um, that's it's it's an interesting uh, question. I think um, I think we. I, I, I can talk to you about with my hat that I had as a member of a mm -hmm. government uh, recently. I think, uh, you know, uh, it is very important that um, we spend a lot of time in financial literacy, uh, mm -hmm. way more from a public policy perspective. And, um, and this, is, this is very important. This is also important that the institution like La Caisse, we, we have this, this very special relationship with the population of Quebec at La Caisse. You know, we claim to be as the Budland des Québécois. And I think this is a very important relationship because this is how, you know, like, so we, but we need to explain to Quebecers what we do. Why do we invest this way to actually, and this is why I find this so fascinating that an institutional investors like ours, as this dual mandate. A few years ago, I know that in some corners, I mean, I, I used to, I lived in Toronto for 10 years. I know we were kind of snobbing this issue that the case the depot had two ads, you know, or two goals. One was the return to depositors and the other is actually uh, the, the economic development of Quebec. But no yeah. surprise, you know, we were able to show that with the two mandates, we were able to get returns that were uh, you know, and really at the high end of all of our peers, and that actually it's not antinomic. The the this focus on better alignment of capital with su sustainable development and returns to depositors, and I mm -hmm. think this is. But you need to ex you need to explain. You need to be transparent about it. We need to actually, as Canal said, the, the the proxy voting will actually create a better alignment as well. I really believe that within five years, five to 10 years, I promise you, we'll have this panel and uh, we will be saying that ESG is now mainstream and that actually <laughs> it is essential for everyone and any investment and no investments will be made without this. Just look at the, at the rating agency. Modi mm -hmm. said last year when they came to the UN that actually in all of their ratings, they were taking into account ESG and that last year for 30% of their ratings, ESG played a role in, in either going downward or upward role in the in directly. The correlation was direct in the rating that they did. So when you, you know, this is this is sending a very, very key mess. So the consumers are sending a key message. And yeah. then the, the rating agencies and all of the ecosystem around is sending the message that you 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 know. Capital, if we want capitalism to succeed, 
and I'm a believer in free markets. But if we want this, we need to understand that mm. we have a role. Those of us who have influence over capital mm. have a role to make sure that we are part of the solution to the biggest challenges that this world is facing. If mm. not, we will lose our social license to operate. If mm. not, we will have, you know, this is a very big danger what we're in now with the pandemic. What we've seen is that with the pandemic is we, we you know, inequal inequalities were a very serious problem before the pandemic. Inequalities will be even a bigger problem. We've seen that it has exacerbated the, 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 the impact on people mm. and mm -hmm. and and we've seen that inequalities also have been exacerbated because of the pandemic just think about di digitalization just think about actually in some of our societies who are the most sick and and who yeah. you know who, and 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 so we know now that we're only as strong as this uh, as the weakest link of us all and we mm. and we know the cost of it and so that's why mm. we I said you know we we need to look at risk differently Mm. And uh, as a society, and as investors, mm. I mean, uh, Christy, from from your point of view, how well equipped is the asset management industry to deal with those two things we've just been talking about? So the, the personalization element, but also this democratization element, and helping finance to help more people. Yeah, so I would say with the customization element, I think I would sort of echo um, Kanal's comments that I do think the industry has over time developed the tools and techniques, obviously batch, backed by the accelerate, accelerating use of technology to be able mm. to deliver high degrees of customization to individuals. The other thing that I would note is I do think that there is a really val value and viable role for the advisor as a part of this ESG conversation. So again, if I look back at some of the survey results that... that uh, we um, th that we fielded earlier in the year, what you find is that well over 50% of the individuals we surveyed would like to have a bigger and broader conversation around ESG factors as part of their overall portfolio, portfolio review. So I think we shouldn't lose, lose sight of the fact that advisors can play a meaningful role here in helping to translate again for people their values into a set of investment choices um, which are well aligned. In terms of this whole notion of the democratization of finance um, and investment more broadly, um, I guess I would have a, a couple of points. Um, first, again, I would um, you know, echo Kanal's comments that I think in order for people to become truly engaged with their finances, they need mm -hmm. to have a compilation of three things, knowledge, interest, and time. And unfortunately, that Venn diagram doesn't occur for a lot of people. And it's one of the reasons why we tend to see that most people remain fairly unengaged, even with major financial decisions in their life, like retirement planning. Yeah. I do think that ESG does potentially offer a bright light. In fact, if we look at some of the survey results, again, that were published by other houses over the course of the summer, well, what they found is that the pandemic was really changing the consciousness of people. Because they had personally experienced the pandemic, most of them had either you know, a friend or a relative who had either lost their job or potentially been furloughed. They obviously saw the impact on local businesses. So it was very visible to many people. And what it's allowing, I think, increasingly people to do is to make that connection between the yeah. biggest challenges that we're facing as a society and the economic and financial impact that not addressing them can have. And again, I think this does help to propel interest in economics and finance because it really creates a tangible tie between what people are experiencing and seeing in their everyday lives and what's in their portfolio. Mm. And I think, weirdly, that, that connection didn't work for a lot of people before. There was this lack of understanding that the money you put away for your retirement goes to fund certain, certain companies. But uh, an event like this that I did earlier this year really brought this home. I was talking to the chief investment officer at the Ch Chicago Teachers Pension Fund, and mm -hmm. she was saying that they specifically invest in Black-owned businesses and Black-owned projects, and they address issues that are particularly pertinent to lower socioeconomic groups. And this is precisely what their stakeholders expect from them, and they can see the difference that it makes. And that makes me think of the point you were raising around George Floyd is that that whole movement has become much more central to the investment process than it than than ever before how does the investment industry 
I feel like it's tackled green issues reasonably well. How does it translate that across into dealing with social issues? Yeah, so I mean, I would say a couple of things. I think as you're well aware, Katie, we've been, you know, involved in doing third party engagement uh, for large, sophisticated institutions in the ESG arena for well over 20 years. And of course, when we think about engagement, that includes not just the E and the G, but also the F. Um, and I do think you very rightly point out that the S has taken on greater prominence over the course of the last six to nine months. And I think that's because COVID has really helped us to unearth some real issues around labor practices, you know, things like sick leave, uh, access to, to hazard pay. I mean, all these things have really been brought into relief, you know, through the global pandemic. So I would say we continue to engage on those things. We also, um, as you know, um, are very active in terms of how we use our vote as it relates to diversity. Yep. Um, so when we think about voting on a slate of directors for a public company, we like to see um, a nice representation of gender mix. Um, you know, in terms of voting on a, on, at a slate, we like to see two women, both in North America and Canada. We like to see 30% in the UK, 30% in EMEA, and, and one everywhere on a global basis, obviously recognizing that there are regional uh, disparities in terms of representation on the basis of gender. But I think the question you're asking is, where do we go from here? How do we take yeah. it from just gender to race and ethnicity? And I think the answer is that we're going to be moving quite strongly in that direction as, you know, active owners and, and stewards. Um, mm -hmm. So we're currently looking at engaging with companies over the course of the next year on the ethnic and racial makeup of boards. And we expect to have some pretty hard voting lines sort of promulgated uh, in 2022. So not very far away. Mm -hmm. I, I, if I could just add a quick uh, sentence there. I, I think the other th opportunity here for us is we are an industry that is awash in data. Yeah. <laughs> and in every aspect of our work, you know, we obsess over data and use data to make decisions. And I believe that we have a huge opportunity, just as we have demanded um, standardization of financial data around the world over time, mm -hmm. that we also start to expect companies to start to disclose information in a standardized way so that it can be consumed and compared in, in, in that fashion. Companies are hesitant and often um, it's not for bad reasons. It's because they're starting their journey and they don't want to be called out if they're trying to do the right thing, um, but maybe the data doesn't look quite right just yet. But I think we have to create that space. And, um, you know, we're starting to work with a lot of asset owners who now want this data, uh, not only at company levels, but even at asset managers. And they're saying, uh, we don't want to, you know, park money with asset managers who aren't doing, um, you know, some of the things that they would expect companies to do. So um, I, I believe there's a great opportunity with data because it really, um, you know, invites sunlight in. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way to, I think, really start to change the conversation. So I hope everyone who's participating here is thinking about that angle as well. And, you know, certainly at Morningstar and Sustainalytics, that's going to be a big part of how we try to, mm -hmm. um, you know, move things forward. Do you feel like you already that, that data already covers this social element pretty well? I don't. I, right. I think it's um, it depends by region. And the biggest issue is that there are no um, requirements for reporting. Yeah. And so it's left to self-reporting. And certainly companies, if you take a look at corporate social responsibility reports, for example, are sharing information in a very, very different way and with very, mm. very different intent. So... Um, it's great that many companies are doing it. It's a step in the right direction, but the um, ability to compare is certainly lacking at this stage. Yeah. Yeah, I would just echo Katie. You know, I mean, I think there's tons of data out there, but it's hard to parse through the data and get apples to apples comparisons. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons, you know, why organizations like SB, I think, are so important. And I, and I really like the comparison to accounting and financial data. You know, having a standards body in place that can focus both on conformity of data, but also on the materiality of the data provided in terms of its impact on overall financial performance. Yeah. I, I think it's only, we're the only, I agree with what my two colleagues say in terms, I think we're only in the infancy on data and reporting and all of yeah. that. And, and I think it's the, it's that will happen, you know, I, and I see some critics who say greenwashing and all of that. And like, like we shouldn't, uh, you know, we, we should be s skeptical of everything that is uh, 
uh, you know, not measured properly mm. or like they were me- uh, other. So on that measurement, I think that the case of the pool, we're, we've, we've started the invest, the institutional leadership network, ILN, to actually make sure that amongst institutional investors, we could uh, actually work together to exchange how we're going to report on climate, yeah. how we're going to measure things. And so you'll have many initiatives like that that will come out and that will be helpful. And then, you know, uh, the the issue of the S of ESG, I think we're only at the outset of what it really means. I think coming out of this pandemic will be actually, they will be, uh, I, I, I think it's unclear. I think institutional yeah. investors, for example, are very good at defined the E of environment and the G of governance quite well. The, the S is still a struggle. Is it diversity? Is, is it more than that? Just take the uh, the U.S. roundtable on the uh, the CEOs of roundtable that came out in uh, in August uh, 2019. Talk about something. Uh, many people just said poo poo that initiative and said, you know, this is this is. I think it was 180 CEOs of the biggest U.S. Mm-hmm. companies that came together and said, well, this is just a marketing tool. They came together to say that actually the uh, the purpose of corporations was not only solely to make profits, but actually you had to take into account the stakeholders. And I reread it recently, and I was amazed. The first few lines of this declaration are about uh, the labor and are mm. about compensation of workers and uh, as a social license to operate for them. And I was like, that they felt compelled to do this and come out in a statement like this, that was quite big. So the impact of it is still unclear and where it's going to go the next step. But I'll give you an example at La Caisse de Depot of what we're doing. I think coming out of this pandemic, I, I was in government. So I know that governments have a very, I mean, and now it's been even made tougher with this pandemic, but a very, very little fiscal margin. And, um, Investments, as I said, the issues, the main issues, climate change, inequalities require a lot of investment in infrastructure. Where will that money come from? That money will need to come from in part from institutional investors. So one example we're doing at La Caisse, and I think it's a relevant model for the future. So imagine an institutional investors that will now own, uh, that we've designed, built, we will operate and own. Um, a, a, a light rail network around Montreal. I think 68 kilometers of light rail network. So we've partnered with uh, the, the government of Quebec, the government of Canada. We've partnered with Hydro Quebec, which is the energy uh, supplier. We've partnered with some of the association of municipalities around. So this is this was a very very creative partnership for sustainable mm-hmm. infrastructure. This will change the way actually workers will uh, commute between their home and, uh, and, and their work in downtown Montreal. And, and, and so my point is that's contributing to a challenge of a society where we operate. And so you'll see that more and more, and it will take the form of very surprising partnerships that mm. you have never seen before. And looking again, taking, looking at risk very differently than before. And so that's going to take a bit of a a really we'll have to do, you know, projects like this and learn and Mm. and and actually, you know, see what works, what doesn't work and then uh, try to do it in other sectors. I think it's very important. And I think it's because a lot of, you know, if you take the very traditional view of institutional investors of 20 years ago or 10 years ago, people would have been incredibly surprised and shocked that an an institutional investor like Lacaze would have done such a thing. But I think mm. it's going to come more and more common. Yeah, commuting. I remember that. It was a thing that I used to do at a certain <laughs> point in, in history. <laughs> well, one interesting question that's come in from the audience that I think, Christy, you might be in a good position to answer is around how we enforce or how, how uh, asset holders enforce preferences around diversity and inclusion. Is that a particular challenge? So I think the challenge uh, of, of enforcing that or, or even requesting it and asking for it is that in some places that data is actually quite difficult to collect. Um, so for example, global data on race is very, very difficult to collect because yeah. of different privacy laws across, across the globe. 
So, so I do think there are some complications to it. I also think that you know, anytime you want to look at diversity measures, you have to look at them in the context of the system in which any company is operating. And that's, of course, what we do. And that's why we set different standards for different regions. Um, so yeah, I do think there's some, some complexity to it, but that doesn't mean that I think asset owners should shy away from answering, from asking the questions. Um, and, and I think to the best of their ability, uh, their providers on the asset management space, uh, should, should answer and address them. I, I also think, you know, and we, we've talked about that. It's really important to look at diversity, you know, on a corporate level to understand the mix of both senior management as well as board representation, because we've certainly found over time that the more diversity that you have at the top of an organization, the better decisions, um, the better that decisions are made um, and the lower the overall risk uh, in terms of company performance. So all sorts of great things from a performance perspective uh, coming out of diversity, definitely uh, a material factor. So one that we should close that we should follow closely, but obviously recognize there are some limitations around. Yeah, for sure. And a, a, another question to you, Christy, on on that theme is: so, for example, at the FT, we work really hard to try and quote fifty percent men and fifty percent women in in market stories on our pages, and it's really hard because there just are so few women in fund management. There are so few women in economics and 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 on on the sell side in banking. How does the industry itself address this? Because there's a certain kind of physician heal thyself element to this. Yes, yes. So, you know, this is the passion place for me, uh, Katie. So, you know, I believe strongly in this whole notion of she can be what she can see or what she mm -hmm. can, you know, I think if we're thinking about really bringing up a population that doesn't see gender barriers in terms of entering finance, in terms of becoming an expert. Um, and and highly financially just literate in in their own personal affairs, we really need to change the complexion of media. And you know, one of the things, and I, and I can't even remember where I read the quote, but it was just a beautiful quote because it talked about the fact that you know diversity that we have you know in our C suite today, that we have in our senior leadership today, we can't change that um, at the flip of a coin. But you know what, we can change. We can change the faces that we put out there. And it's one of the reasons why I am so committed uh, to doing media myself, and also why I would urge other women and people of color, of color across the industry to really lean into media, um, because I do think it's a place where we can make a difference quite quickly. So thank yeah. you for bringing that up. Yeah. And we're not scary. We're quite nice to talk to sometimes. Um <laughs> Um, so this is the, all the kind of the high principle here, and I think we're all kind of on the the same page with it. But Kunal, what can you tell us around how these strategies have performed this year? Because that's one of the really interesting things around ESG strategies is that in 2020, markets got taken to the woodshed at a certain point, and it was ESG strategies that not only pulled in the funds but also showed that they can be resilient. How much of a difference does that make? Yeah. Um you sort of uh, gave away a little bit of the answer and through Katie, um, there's been a significant amount of outperformance among uh, ESG strategies. And I think it's uh, interesting that that conversation is happening because in the investment universe anyway, so much of the focus around whether to do ESG or not is really around this notion of um, whether such a strategy has the potential to out or underperform. And most of the belief has been that ESG underperforms. Now it's sort of starting to change to maybe it outperforms. And I guess like, I, I think that debate has some validity up to a point, but I also think we should get past it. And, you know, what, what, I, what I mean by that is I, I think the constant debate about over and under performance actually clouds the ability to do all the things that we're talking about on this panel and to really have a deeper look into ESG preferences, which I think are really what we're talking about and building portfolios around preferences, I think uh, more around impact. Um, my, my gut is that generally speaking, when companies start to take on better corporate governance principles, they start to do better. And in this conversation, we focus very heavily on the E and the S, but we should also just say G has never been controversial no. in, 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 in corporate circles. And most money managers worth anything will not 
invest in companies with poor governance because it is a given mm. that it will lead to underperformance. And so I, I think like we have to think about the E and the S in similar ways. If, if we do believe the world is changing environmentally and that, um, you know, there are some real challenges that require us to shift to a green carbon economy. Why would we not think about building portfolios that, you know, from a capitalistic perspective, offer the opportunity to capitalize on what is most likely to be the economy of the future? Mm. Right. And, and so the short answer is, of course, in, in the recent past, there has been meaningful outperformance. Some have attributed that to the fact that growth factors have done pretty well and uh, ESG strategies have a yep. growth tilt. And so that is entirely true. But I honestly believe that the discussion about under and outperformance ultimately is secondary to the reality that most people are absorbing this and moving on. And just as like 30 years ago when I began my career and we would try to talk to um, financial advisors about risk, people would say, risk, what's that? I'm not interested in talking about risk. I want to talk about returns. Today, risk is incorporated into any conversation in such a natural fashion. We, we spend so much time around it. And Katie, my guess is that in 10 years, when you're moderating a panel, either with the three of us or with others, we're going to talk about ESG just like it's a regular part of a portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. And it just becomes central to that conversation. And so if you're not thinking of it that way and you're sort of hung up on this mentality of over and, out, over and out performance, I actually think you're stuck up on what used to be the SRI world, which is socially responsible investing, which was a world of exclusion. I don't like yeah. tobacco stocks. I don't like gun stocks. I'm excluding that from my portfolio. ESG is about inclusion. I have a view of the future, and that view is perhaps that a, you know, a, a, we're going to need a green economy and, 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 I'm, and we, we want to support uh, companies that are carbon neutral because they're going to be winners. Like that's a clear view and you build a portfolio around it. It's mm. inclusionary. And mm. so I feel like that shifts the debate from are you going to un underperform, outperform to I have a view just as I might have had a macro view on the world. Do you have, this is a macro view in some ways and my portfolio is going to reflect that. And so um, to me, that's critical in the way we think about the future. Yeah, and it is a totally different discussion. I mean, certainly when I do panels like this, when I talk to investors in the Nordic region, they this is so obvious to them. They've been doing this for so long. They feel like this is just standard risk management. I mean, uh, Mac Andre, you, you touched on this right at the start. I mean, do you think this whole debate around returns against risk management has shifted? This is this is actually just prudent investment apart from anything else. Well, for, for La Caisse, it is prudent investment. And it is, uh, as Canal said, it's part of the risk analysis for now. I mean, like we, every investment we get at the investment committee, we look at, uh, at, uh, at the SG aspect and we look mm -hmm. at the diversity aspect. We look at the climate aspect. We look at all of these, all of these things. And so it's factored in into the, the, the decision making process. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's something that we need to, uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 I, you know, let's talk about just the, the issue of, uh, it's, it's something that we need. I, it reminds me of a story that I had when I arrived at the UN and the deputy secretary general of the time, who was actually a Swedish guy, a great guy, he said to me, you know, what we do at the UN is, and if you want a good sustainable world, Think of it as a stool with three legs. So mm -hmm. it has the security part and the government slash uh, human rights part and the development part. And if we only work on the one leg of the stool at a time, it doesn't work. We need to work on the three legs. And that makes it very complicated. And, you know, and it's a bit the same thing. It's a bit the same thing with diversity, for example. There's no magic bullet for diversity. Uh, it, you need to work on the culture of each of our institutions. We need to work uh, to make sure that, uh, uh, that there's the right pipeline. We need to work with the demand for it. We need to uh, have, uh, have metrics. We need to have proxy voting. We are, in the case, we have ambassadors within that case thinking about it. We need to have funds that create funds like the one we created, the 25-3 funds that I've talked about earlier. And so it's all about these things that it's uh it's uh it's 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 always going to be continuing a work in progress but the time where i think has shifted one big thing that we will see at the end 
is this view that, you know, pure free market rules, like the, the ones who believe like in very capitalism that private sector needed to just do good and inv invest and returns. And that's the only thing. I think our, I, I, I saw an article in your, I mean, in your, in your newspaper last week that was very good on that, on the, an analysis of Milton Friedman's uh, text. It was assuming that governments could do all of the rest. Well, we know yeah. that government cannot do all of the rest. So we know that this, so that's why you need to have these innovative partnerships. And it's part of that. It's looking at risk differently. If you only consider financial risk, now you're missing a big picture. And Kunal said that a few years ago, people were not even talking about risk. So we mm. need to evolve with the times and with the situation and, under, and acknowledge that actually society has decided to give capital in the hands of a few very big institutional investors. And we can just cannot you know, invest it. Yes, we have fiduciary duty to our depositors. But we all, our depositor also is, are asking us more and more to make sure that there's a world that will yeah. be sustainable when they will receive their revenue <laughs> from the funds that we, we manage at the moment. Yeah, you got to hope so, right? I mean, um, Christy, um, just thinking about what uh, Marc Andre was saying there. There is, there's obviously a role for, for government here, and there's big questions around what fiduciary duty means in relation to ESG investment. In that context, what kind of difference do you think the U new administration in the US might make when that comes into force? Well, I certainly hope the impact will be roll back some of the uh, regs that we saw, obviously promulgated very late in the Trump administration, which I think, quite frankly, will probably make ESG investing as well as potentially uh, the exercise of active ownership more more difficult. So, so I'm hoping a, a very a very positive impact. Um, I did want to go maybe back um, because I know we're we're getting close to time. Maybe go back to one of the points um, that uh, Kanal made just on you know resistance to ESG investing and sort of the continuation of this myth um, that purpose and performance don't go hand in hand. And I would just note, and sort of looking at some of the recent survey work that we did, we still found that about 45% of individuals actually wanted to see the connection between risk, return, and ESG. It's almost as though for that segment of the population, seeing that sort of flow through was a gating item for them. So I think, you know, as practitioners, we really shouldn't underestimate that. And I think, again, we're at, we're at this sort of unique moment in time where we've seen strong performance, where we've seen personal impact of COVID. And I think that presents a huge opportunity for all of us to push towards the tipping point. That's not my dog. I thought it might be my dog at a certain point, but my, <laughs> my dog has managed to stay, to stay quiet. But also, I mean, Christy, thinking in terms of, of your clients, to the extent that there might be any sort of clash between um, between performance and and purpose, do you think there's a growing community of clients now that kind of don't mind? They really don't mind taking lower performance if if they think that they're getting something purposeful out of it. I guess I just have the view that they shouldn't have to, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I say you know I'm at the point where I I actually firmly believe that in order to invest successfully in the world to come, you need to consider ESG factors. I totally agree with Kanal's sentiment that in five to seven years, we'll be stacking up traditional financial factors with ESG factors and considering them peri pursu. My only point was that we aren't there yet and we yeah. need to push towards that migration. We can't just assume it's going to happen. And, mm. and again, I think it's important for financial return, but it's also important maybe going back you know, to the points that Marc Andre mentioned, is that we, we need to use capital as a force, yeah. right? In order to get to the place that we need to be, in order to address the most pressing issues that we have, whether that's climate change or the social issues that we've been talking about throughout the course of our conversation today, mm. capital needs to be mobilized to move the world in a more positive direction. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Marc Andre, I mean, this is something that, that Christy's also touched on, just the, the generational shift and this shift of wealth through to a, to a younger generation that's thought about these issues is, I guess that's the big underlying support for this sort of investment style now. Well, I think that's the demand side. And when you 
just think, just remember, uh, I mean, we tend to forget all of this now, but like, uh, just remember uh, when uh, young school children thought that no action was happening on climate, when we thought that the yeah. first accord was about to die. And, uh, and actually they came in by hundreds of thousands, like, like at, in every city that they came in. So it's millions of people who walked. So you, they, they came out naturally and on strike on Fridays and stuff around the world. I mean, the biggest demonstration ever in the city of Montreal was on, uh, with, uh, with, uh, on this issue, uh, on, uh, by uh, school children. So my point is there's a generational shift. I mean, the millennials, but even those following it. And I think, um, and I think, I think I'm, I'm hopeful for all of this. But just look at the, at the, what happened this week. You know, you had that a year ago. Uh, I, when we thought in September 2019 that actually the case of the Paris Accord uh, was almost, you know, people were saying, well, it's, it's, it's dwindling, it's dead or whatever. And fast forward a year and a, a bit ago in the middle of a pandemic, and now we say that it's a success and it's more alive than anything else and the commitments are back in and that, that actually they're, they're very ambitious plans. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so... Uh, I, I'm hopeful for that. Just think about, I look at uh, Christie, who represents a bank. I mean, many, many, many financial institutions in Canada made incredibly very big commitments on alignment of, uh, of, um, of uh, their capital with sustainable development and on climate issues. Like uh, most of them uh, by, you know, 100 billions at the time, you know. And so uh, we, so mm. this is unprecedented as a as move. So I think we're, we're, I'm actually very optimistic about that and about mm. how it's moving, really. And as you say, the, these, these school kids are out on the streets and, you know, when they get their hands on some money, certainly I know my children in a million years are not going to be wanting to put their, you know, their, their savings away with, with, with you know, yeah. companies or with industries that they consider to be dirty. I mean, there's obviously a, a danger that we look back on what we do now in a few years' time and it looks really outdated and standards have moved forward. But I guess there's no point letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? And you've got to just move on with what you think is best practice now. And let's not be... we. For example, I'll tell you one place where we spend a lot of time at like guys. Yes, we have these 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 objectives of lo of of lowering our carbon footprint. Uh, we have the compensation, as I said, and we mm -hmm. all of that. But the biggest where we're going to make the biggest difference, I can tell you, is helping our portfolio companies do better on their climate footprint. It's actually mm -hmm. helping some of these companies to transition. That's how you 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 move the needle. And that's how. And so let's let's let's. Uh, there's no one magic bullet. It's like you know, we discussed about diversity. It's the same mm. thing here. And uh, I think uh, I think on that, uh, you know, the, and the market will tell, you know, like the rating agency will talk, the consumers will talk. And, uh, and we, the, you know, so, you know, the, the, we see some of the uh, investors and w w big players in financial services will actually align themselves as well. Yeah, so, for sure. Well, we have to wrap it up there. It's been a great discussion. Um, Christy, Kunal, Marc-André, and, and a dog that's very excited about sustainable investment. Thank you so much for chatting to me this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. having us, Katie. Have a good day. Thank you for having us. It was a privilege.